The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. We've, after years and years of pursuing adoption and having our daughter, um, we're then walking through a cancer diagnosis. Lauren and Michael McAfee shared their experience that challenged the illusion of control. I remember, the thing I remembered is walking our daughter in the hospital, holding her as a uh, 18 month old or 20 month old, I guess at the time, down to um, surgery and um, just feeling like completely powerless. Next on Life Today. Welcome to Life Today. I'm Randy Robinson. Tammy Trent is with me as always. Hello. Good to see you. Good to um, see you. Okay, today's guests uh, have a book called Beyond Our Control. But before we talk about the book, I want to tell you about Michael and Lauren McAfee because she's the ministry director at Hobby Lobby. Have you ever heard of that in a second? I, mean, I, I have never heard of that, but I loved it when I saw the ministry director at Hobby Lobby. Minister, I don't know what that looks like. So I, <laughs> welcome to the program. Oh, thanks. Thanks and for having here. us. I just got to ask you, I mean, I recognize Hobby Lobby is a little different, but it's in yeah. the secular marketplace, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What is a ministry director at Hobby Lobby? It's a good question. Yeah, people, a lot of times when they see my title, like, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean for a company? So Hobby Lobby has, um, uh, a segment of the company where th that manages the philanthropy, basically. The okay. philanthropy that happens from the corporate company. And so I get to oversee some of the philanthropy aspect of what the company does. So ministry director is the title that goes with that, but that's what that means. So it's okay. a lot of fun. I, yeah, I just get to Love see it. neat things happening around yeah. the country and around our community that, that Hobby Lobby gets to be a small part of, and it's a blessing. I wish every company had that. I this is how we're gonna. This is how we're gonna bless people with some of the proceeds of our company. Mm -hmm. What a great right. idea! All right, shop at Hobby Lobby. There you go. Yes, shop at Hobby Lobby. Right? <laughs> right. Where's your plug? Right <laughs> All right. So let's beyond our control. This is this is a very personal book for you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Give us a little introduction to what we're talking about here. Yeah. So. The title Beyond Our Control was really born out of just experiences in Michael and I's life that, mm -hmm. that we walked through where we were recognizing just how little control we had over kind of the outcomes that we were facing. Um, so particularly we share about walking years and years of infertility. We share about um, the hard aspects of our adoption journeys. Mm -hmm. We have two beautiful adopted daughters, but um, there were many years that there were a lot of heartache and waiting and, and trying to make things happen and just things falling apart in that. And as well, uh, once we adopted one of our daughters, we were a family uh, with her, had her in our home for just six weeks, and then she faced a cancer diagnosis, mm. wow. um, a shocking cancer diagnosis. And so it was, you know, a sudden in surgery, hospitalizations, chemotherapy, and, and walking through wow. all of Gosh. that with our one and a half year old at the time. Um, she's doing great now. She's been in remission for four, four years this month, actually. Mm. And we praise wow. God for that. But yes. there were so many pain points points in our journey of, of loss, of a longing for good things that weren't coming our way, um, and for walking through seasons where we were striving to do mm -hmm. good things and striving to make things happen with our own um, strength and realizing, you know, a lot of these things were just completely out of our control. And so you wrestle through that and have to remind yourself or believers mm -hmm. to trust in the God who has control over all things, yeah. right? He's, wow, he's yes. in control of all things, yes. yet he's still allowing these things to happen in your life that are hardships mm -hmm. and are mm -hmm. challenging. Yeah. And so wrestling through then again, that your theology of what you believe about God, if he is in control, he does have control over all things, then is he good? And what does it right. mean that he's allowing these hard things? Yeah. What does it mean that we, we after years and years of pursuing adoption and having our daughter, um, wow. we're then walking through a cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. That that was something that we really had to wrestle through mm -hmm. just with our faith. Mm -hmm. and, and so we write about that in the book of helping people by telling some aspects of our story that maybe are unique to us, but really could be this theme that I think hopefully others can relate to of we all walk circumstances in life that 
completely knock us off our feet or, or totally out of our control. Yeah. And we have to wrestle with what does that mean? And we really believe in those hard seasons, those dark points of our story and of our life. Yeah, yeah I, I, I need to ask a man question here. Yeah, go for uh, it. Because <laughs> Michael, I observe that you are a man. <laughs> um, Good observation. Accurate. Very intuitive. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Are you a man like most men in the sense that <laughs> oh, no. when it comes to family <laughs> things, you 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 want to take care of things. You want to you want to fix things. Yeah. yeah, right. But when things are beyond our control, that right. sense of powerlessness, right. That's difficult for me. Yeah. Did you struggle with that? Oh, absolutely. Well, that's I mean, even beyond family, that was part of our journey was, you know, we were a very normal average couple and so everything that we sort of felt like we wanted or expected in life, for us, we were blessed that it was sort of within our grasp. It felt like it was within our own power. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to, um, we, we got married while we were in college. And so we worked hard and we're able to um, make, you know, marriage happen to my Sunday school sweetheart and uh, <laughs> yeah. make that happen as college students. And then we wanted to, you know, you know, the jobs we wanted and, and we wanted to write, and, you know, like, th things we wanted to do. It just like you roll your sleeves up and work hard and have a positive attitude and things kind of fall into place. Yeah. And then it was, shocking when for us the the thing that was beyond our control that was so obvious to us was children we just expected like mm -hmm. you are able to have children when you expect uh, children to come when that wasn't happening and we first started with adoption we were first mm -hmm. going through the adoption path and journey and things kept going from slow down to shut down and mm -hmm. door after door closed we were waiting hoping to get matched for um, hoping to get matched for over six years while we were wow. just waiting, went from one country to the next, pursuing international adoption for a number of reasons, and just felt like all of our friends and other people in our life that things were falling into place for them. And so you begin to look at yourself going, Lord, why why not us? Yeah. What's, mm -hmm. Why are things not falling into place? And uh, again, doing everything in our power, thinking that it was going to come about. And so then finally, when we experienced that joy of, of bringing home our daughter, um, Zion, mm -hmm. And and then six weeks in, finding this this cancer diagnosis out of mm. out of the blue, out of nowhere, mm. no one saw it coming. Incidental yeah. find, and uh, just feeling like once again you're plunged into this area of going, Lord, I I thought we had already done our time right. of you know of sort of waiting and, and heartache and things like that as we were longing for children in the first place. And now not only do we have that story, but we have this this unexpected, uh, unknown route of cancer, of having no clue what that would mean for yeah. us. And so mm -hmm. I remember, the thing I remembered is walking our daughter in the hospital, holding her as a uh, 18 month old or 20 month old, I guess at the time, down to um, surgery and um, just feeling like completely powerless wow. of, I can do nothing. I'm not a doctor, I have no medical back. I can do nothing mm -hmm. to take this tumor out of her. And that old phrase of, I have no idea, I don't know what tomorrow holds, mm. but I know who holds tomorrow. Mm. I know that God, even though I don't feel it, like I have to trust him, I have to trust these doctors because I'm powerless to do anything to change her, mm. her circumstance. So that was our journey with her. What can I ask you about, I love, I loved reading this in your book. Can I ask you to tell me about Ezra? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it was shortly after our daughter, Zion, who walked through the cancer experience. Once she was in remission, we were talking about um, just kind of what we were feeling led to, and it was to walk into adoption again. So we had pursued an international adoption with our daughter, Zion, and then we pursued a domestic adoption um, in the state where we live. And we were, had filled out the paperwork, and we were actually pretty quickly matched. And so we wow. got a call that there was a baby boy born, and birth mom had chose us to parent. And so we went to the hospital. We met her, and we met um, this child, Ezra, who became our son. So we took him home from the hospital and just had, um, yeah, just this sweet now family of four that we were having our son and our daughter. And... We, we were mo moving forward with the adoption process. It was a private adoption. And the agency, you know, was walking us through all of the process of that when we eventually found out that it was going to be a bit of a unique situation and how um, the adoption had to go to a different type of court and there was going to be a trial. And so we were just told wow. to, like, wait, wow. wait until the, a judge can review this case and wait until you find out kind of the fate of your family. Wow. 
And because it was during COVID, courts were really backed up. And so this wasn't just what affected us. This affected everyone that was dealing with the court system. People were kind of just had to have their lives on pause and their lives yeah. on hold. And so we had our son in our home for 12 months before they finally heard his case. And through some very unusual decisions that happened um, in our case, we ended up having to say goodbye to our son in a matter of two hours. Oh. And we haven't seen or heard from him since. Oh, wow. So wow. we had this child, we had a son, and it was our wow. daughter's brother. You right. know, she didn't know any yes. different. And so the hardest thing was explaining to our um, three-year-old at the time that she had to say goodbye forever to her mm. brother, which is not something any child should ever have to right. walk. No. And we all kind of thought we would be a family forever. For most of that time, he was in our home. And so that sudden loss mm -hmm. was definitely the grief that you experience in loss. Mm -hmm. for, for any loss is challenging. It was a unique loss in that it wasn't to death. And so um, I found it was hard to even explain sometimes mm, what yeah. that felt like. But, I mean, for us, he was he was our son. We loved him. If yes. anyone's ever... Um, been through the adoption process, you know that that child is your child. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had this season just of having to process the reality that we didn't have this son yeah. that we thought we were going to have for exactly. forever. Yes. And again, having to turn to the Lord and say, God, yeah. you orchestrated all of this. Like yeah. You knew when we took him home into our home and into our lives. Yeah you knew that this would be not, this would not be a forever thing. You know, yeah. we didn't know, but God yeah. knew. Yet you still, this is the path you had for us. And mm so um, in our lack of knowing why and, and understanding why that would happen, you choose to trust in a God who mm. is good and who has um, his glory and our good in mind through the pain points that we yeah. walk. And we don't know, you know, why we don't understand that. And mm -hmm. we, you know, we don't, uh, a lot of times on this side of heaven, we won't ever know why we walk through That's some right. of the things we That's do, right. but God is still good and we yeah. still trust him. And Lauren, purpose. There, there are so many people that are on a path they didn't expect. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I've been on that path. Yeah. 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 Do you believe that God works all things out for his mm. good, mm -hmm. or don't you? Yeah. 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 You know, and I think you guys probably left that courthouse, I can only imagine, and just thought, God, like, I didn't see this coming. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect yeah. this. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. How do I trust you? when everything mm. changes and I didn't see it coming, how do I trust that your hand is in this? Yeah. How do you encourage somebody today that, that maybe isn't on the ground just yeah. surrendering all oh. that just says, I'm, I'm done, yeah. I'm just mad. Yeah. yeah, no, we've certainly been in those places. And I, I think of two stories in scripture that we see God brings people through really painful hardships. Mm -hmm. The obvious one is Job, who obviously lost so much and through it all remained faithful. Yeah. And the other one that I think of is Joseph, who went through so much. He was um, abandoned by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. He was falsely accused and imprisoned, all of these things. Both of these characters, these real people that went through hardship. Um, I, I have always liked Joseph's story because you can see like, oh, at the end, you see why, like God brought him mm -hmm. through all this mm -hmm. and he got to have that aha moment all those years later. Yeah. Saying, oh, like God was doing mm -hmm. this and now I'm able to save my family during this famine because of the position that it put him in. Whereas in Job's story, there's really no, there's no moment in his life. Yes, he has things that are restored, but that doesn't take away the losses that he yeah. had. He obviously still always would miss the children he lost, even though he had more children later. Um, yeah. But he never got to see the hindsight of like, oh, this is why God did that. And so in our own lives, mm -hmm. we might not get that opportunity to see like, oh, here's what God was mm -hmm. doing this side of heaven. Yeah. But we can see how God for 
generations for millennia has used the book of Job to minister mm. to his people. To you guys. Yes, yes to, us, to me. Yes. To many people through for mm. generations. And so God has used that mm -hmm. for his good and his glory, Amen. even though Job himself never got to see, you know, he, he didn't get to fast forward and see, oh, in 2000 years from now, people are still going to be reading my story right, and seeing right. the goodness and providence yes. of God. Um, so we have, you know, hindsight on Job's story. Um, and so we never know what that might look like, but we trust that God is good and is using all these things for his glory and yeah. our good. And, and even if it didn't, like in our story, even if it didn't serve anyone else, you know, that the way he's used it in our own lives, mm -hmm. you know, so anyone, you know, that's listening that is having a similar kind of experience, it, for me, as I prayed in those days and just felt like the wind was knocked out of me mm. of, you know, kind of, Lord, this is my, this is my son. Like, this is mm. not just... This is not a situation where, you know, oh, if it ends up and works out that Ezra stays, it's like for a year, like I put my heart and soul every day. I would, when I took him down from nap, I would go, um, he, he sleeps up in a room upstairs and I'd go one step at a time, you know, both feet on each stair and just pray that, Lord, let me keep him. Let me be yes, his dad yes, forever. Yes. And so then when losing yes. him and you feel that pain of like, God, you, this was my son whom mm -hmm. I have loved and now I've lost him, you know, like he's gone from me. Do you understand what that's like to be separate? And I've felt like the Lord just in his kindness was like, I know exactly, yes, I know yes, exactly yes. what this pain is like. That that's yeah. the beauty of the truthfulness of the oh. Christian message is that we have a God that is, that is familiar with, that allows himself to enter into our suffering in Christ and that God himself gave Christ up for us all. And so what better person to turn to than a father that is familiar with the loss of a son? Mm. Well, it's powerful. You know, in, in those situations, you know, we you know, count it all joy and you go, <laughs> I right. a hard time chalking that one up. Yeah. When things mm -hmm. go from beyond our control to seemingly completely out of control. Mm -hmm. Right. But in that process, there, there is, there's hope. There's yeah. peace that passes understanding. There's all these things, yeah. but there's also endurance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's perseverance. Mm -hmm. yes. And I know you guys are still in the middle of this. Mm -hmm. But is there anything that you've learned about perseverance that you might relate to someone who's watching right now, who's like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in that place right now, that would encourage them to persevere? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yes, the James 1, 2 through 4 is uh, dear to both of us. And so it says, consider it pure joy. When you have pure joy, when you face trials, mm -hmm. you know, challenges of various kinds because of the testing of your faith develops perseverance mm -hmm. and perseverance must finish its work so that you may become mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there, we, as we walked this road, I mean, this was an aspect of, of mm -hmm. us feeling like life was beyond our control. It was not like waking up every day and like, all right, like this is great opportunity yeah. to develop perseverance. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, okay, we are taking a week off of work. We are alternating times, watching our daughter so the other can go into the other room and just weep. And, you know, like all these things. We're processing with her too of like the loss that she's suddenly experiencing after we have to sit down and try and explain to her on a, you know, a three-year-old, four-year-old level. And so that journey of just like turning to the Lord, even when we don't feel like it, of showing up at church, even when it didn't feel like getting there and singing the, mm -hmm. the songs, you know, with the group and just going down front and praying, getting on our knees, having community around us. I mean, that was critical to do the things we knew we were supposed to do, the things that would mm. ultimately restore and refresh our soul even when we weren't feeling it in the day because it was putting us in the environment where the Lord could do the work yeah. even when there wasn't an immediate emotional payoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's good, that's good. All right, if you're watching right now and you need someone to pray with you because you're just trying to persevere, which some days just looks like breathing and getting out of bed, mm -hmm. I, I get it. I think all of us get that here. We have those seasons. There's a phone number you can call someone who will lift you up to our heavenly father in prayer is waiting on the other end of that line. At the same time, I know one of the best things we can do when we're in that difficult situation is to look beyond ourselves and say, God, how can we represent you to someone else in their pain? You can do that. Let me show you how. Watch this and you'll see how you can, regardless of where you're at, you can be a blessing to someone else. In so many places around the world, we see people that don't have water, any water to drink. If they do, they're scraping it from the worst places possible. But in some places, like where I'm at right now in Burundi, there seems to be an abundance of water. 
but the water is not safe. Umwana rero namuje mu kwezi kwa kabiri umwana yapfuye abyimbye ndajana kwivuriro umwana ndamugejeje kwivuriro umwana yishwe no kudaho ubyimba bwose inda yari yaragiye umutware waragiye amagejeje kwivuriro umwana taracika It was this water source where she would come and get the water every day in these jugs and take back to her children and it's this water source that took Stella's life. Tinda mugati honda mwibuke ho ho ni huko no tuma imana ubugati changa hano mu musange nta kundi uko ndi kunda mwibuke mba ndi mandi bakagahinda keshi gose mu buzima bwanje. I don't want Jacqueline to have to go through this again. She has other children. She's doing all that she can. Are we doing all that we can? We can change this. We have the power. It's within our power to give them clean drinking water so that she doesn't get to the point where she wants to die. That's why it's critical that we do something right now. You and I can do something. We can come in and we can put a well in this village and they will have clean water. And there are so many other villages just like this. So many other mothers that are experiencing the same pain that Jacqueline is feeling. We want you to join us in reaching around the world to places like this and giving them clean, pure drinking water. Will you do that? Will you give life? Will you give water for life? When you do, you will be changing the lives of mothers like Jacqueline all over the world. Do it today. You know, one interesting thing about this situation with contaminated water is that you, you see adults drinking this water all around uh, and you wonder why would they do that? Well, I mean, the ones that are drinking it as adults survive childhood because contaminated water comes in, especially from when a, uh, an infant goes from nursing to drinking the water and then as they're growing. So it's, it's the young children that are hit the hardest. That's why the mothers suffer so much. Going into a village like that and many others across the world and simply drilling a well to get deep enough to the water that is uncontaminated and then building it in such a way that it will last for an average of 70 years, which is what we do, for we call it water for life. We change that village and the villages around it. We give those children who are at the most risk a chance, a much greater chance at life. And the thing that separates us from a lot of organizations that do wonderful charitable work is that we do this for one reason, because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because the gospel is an outreach to those who are needy, those who are hurting. Because the Bible says, do not forget the poor. That's what we ask you to enter into with us, reaching out with the love of Christ in word and deed. This is what it looks like for this particular campaign. And this is the last week we'll be talking about it on the air. It will be ongoing, so we always need your support. Your gift of $48 today will basically provide water for 10 people for 70 years for a lifetime. A gift of $144 would provide that same fresh, clean drinking water for 30 people. A gift of $4,800 provides, on average, a well. We need to know this now. We need to know this today because we have people down the line in these different places, uh, missionaries, w rig workers, uh, pastors in some places, and we need to tell them, okay, line these villages up. We're coming in. We're giving them water for life. So please, we're wanting you to go to the phone or go online right now. Don't delay. Make the best gift you can because you can enter into their world of suffering and give them some relief. Give them the gospel. And Tammy, you know, you know what it does. This is such a beautiful ministry of hope. 
It is, Randy. And I just, I appreciate your heart so much for those people of Burundi and that mm -hmm. peace. It's just, I know I've been there. When you're actually with the people on the ground, it's, yeah. it's so emotional. It's hard to hold it in sometimes. <laughs> I couldn't do what I do. I know you couldn't do what you do either when we travel to these countries if we didn't know that yeah. there was a sure solution. That's right. There is a solution, and we know how to get there, and we know how to bring them water with your help. So let's do it today. Let's make a difference. Let's bring water, water for life. Every day, thousands of lives are lost to waterborne disease, and nearly half of those are children under the age of five. Through Mission Water for Life, you can give mothers hope and children a future as we provide clean, life-giving water for thousands of children and their families before it's too late. With your gift today, you can help drill and establish 350 water wells this year. Your gift of $24 will help provide clean water for five children. A gift of $48 will help provide for 10. $72 will provide for 15 and $144 will help provide life-giving water for 30 people for a lifetime. With a gift of any amount, we'll send you Daughter, written by James and Betty's granddaughter, Lainey Renee. This insightful book invites all girls and women to walk in the freedom of their God-given identity and embrace who they really are. With your gift of $100 or more, you may request the Great is the Lord decorative blanket, featuring the words of Psalm 145.3, this beautiful blanket is perfect for comfort in cold weather and a reminder of your help with Water for Life. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,200 to help provide water for 250 people or a gift of $4,800 to help sponsor a complete well and request our new bronze sculpture, A Cup of Water, inspired by Jesus' words in Mark 9, 41. This is the last week. Please call, write, or make your gift online. Please do go online or go to the phones if you'd rather, but make the best gift you can. This is the last week we will be talking about this during this campaign on the broadcast show, but your gift will keep on giving and giving and giving. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Tammy, I uh, just, uh, wow. I mean, yes, what, I you guys, I it's been such a blessing. Thank yeah. you for coming out and sharing. Yes. I know it touched Tammy. You could see it in the program. Oh my goodness, it did. It really did. And you know, I, I feel the pain, I feel the hurt. And I also know the joy that you can find mm. in the middle of just tough seasons. Yeah, yeah, amen. So gosh, thanks for being here. Thanks for writing this book. It's so special. It's gonna mean a lot to a lot of people. Mm. And again, if you're struggling today with any of this, please make that call. We do wanna pray with you. We love you and we care about you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Life Today. Fight the Good Fight by James Robinson and Jay Richards reveals the battle for our culture. Constitution shattered, heroes vilified, but hope remains. Unite, repent, and stand firm. Fight the good fight. There's a place that I want to be, and it's on the other side of the fence line. Sarah Haggerty describes the beauty of boundaries and the gift of limitations. Tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.